welcome to the Okta Workforce Identity Developer Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Mike Vandelinder from Jamf. Mike's a product manager in identity. So welcome, Mike. And what is identity in this context? Hey, Emily. Thanks for bringing me on this week. In this context, in Jamf's context, let's say, Identity is one of these main pillars of device management and security, but not a service that we ourselves necessarily employ. You know, across Jamf, which is a litany of services surrounding device management and security, we ourselves are not the identity provider. And we've always decided to partner with some of the best in the industry, like Okta, to fill in the gaps of a lot of those workflows that customers just frankly need to automate so many of the outcomes that are necessary in device management and deployment. Yeah, and today we're here to take a high-level look at the Shared Signals Framework, which is a new web standard that's being developed. I'm excited to get Mike's perspectives on this because his role at Jamf gives him some insight into the problem that the standard solves and also what the other solutions to this problem looked like before we had it. So I personally know Jamf from their Apple device management, and you integrate with Okta to use us as a source of truth on user identity. But your recent security work has also branched out into device identity. So what is device identity and how does that differ from the identity of the user? Any new employee, any new device being configured to work for a particular customer, working inside their environment, we've always had the concept of integrating with the IDP to provide context about that particular user, authenticating them, making sure that it's the right user on a device. But then more recently, we've extended into this world of device identity to ensure that it is a properly you know, understood, managed, secured device that is trying to get access to any particular resource. Um, trying to then provide the context and, and frankly, the identity of that device to external services who also have any sort of a logic engine or policy engine to gate access and approve access. Um, being able to provide what we know about the device and telemetry about that device in those situations that could then be mapped to you know, what is probably already understood context of the user, using that information together to then approve deny as needed. Yeah. What kind of questions about a device might device identity answer? Primarily, I would say whether the device is managed or not. So historically, you know, Jamf is an Apple device management platform. Uh, we've definitely extended into the world of device security in the last few years, but we have a lot of rich contextual information about the state of that device as it's being set up and provisioned, configured for any particular customer environment. Device management is kind of key to ensuring that once that device is in the hands of the user, that it has all the proper configurations and restrictions to have an expected behavior for that environment. So whether that's just making sure that it's able to connect to the right network, make sure it has the right certificates, that has the right passcode requirements. Um, those are all kind of inherent attributes of that device after it's been managed. And then you start kind of bleeding into the world of device compliance. But that that enrollment state, that management state is that that first piece to know kind of where the device even came from in the first place, how it was necessarily procured and, and set that baseline for whatever comes next during um, provisioning. Yeah. So what is this? What's running on it? Do I want it accessing my networks kinds of questions? Exactly. And so it sounds like this device identity is going to need to be integrated with other security tooling. And before there were standards around integrating, what was it like to try to work with a bunch of integrators to send and receive this info where it's needed? Yeah, it's been a journey. Uh, you know, again, being at kind of the core of that device lifecycle for an organization, We've partnered with a number of different services over time to try to solve this probably half a dozen different ways. Um, you know, we know the state of the device. We need to be able to relay that information about device identifiers to some other, you know, third party to then either gate access or approve access to, you know, secure applications, private applications. And every time you go about it, you kind of do it in whatever fashion best befits that particular service. You either uh, assemble the existing APIs or try to create something new. Again, each time you kind of approach one of those integrations, it's more or less starting from scratch or cobbling together, you know, a couple of different ideas. Ouch. So you're kind of, before you would be building kind of one-offs per integrator, it sounds like. I would say that's very much the case. Yes. 
oh man, that sounds a bit like the frustration of having to memorize a bunch of different username and password combinations for every different app you need at work. <laughs> Or there's some sort of a single sign-in. Only you, you scale it up to the problems of code maintenance and you get some real adventures there, I'm sure. Around the time that Jamf was working on this device identity uh, concept, the Shared Signals Working Group at the OpenID Foundation was also developing a standard to address a similar set of security concerns and to make it easier to share that information. So um, the shared signals framework, what they say on their site, sharedsignals.guide or the spec from the uh, working group, is that it improves API efficiency and security by providing privacy protected secure webhooks. So what does that really mean? Looking at how maybe we have tried to solve this a bit in the past, we're kind of always calculating uh, the device's risk posture based on user behavior and other telemetry and what OS versions installed, um, known vulnerabilities, applications, that kind of thing. And being able to extend that information to another party, I would say we've we've we have done, but we've done it through the client because mm -hmm. it it's always aware of the state of itself because it, yeah. it needs to be able to inherently more secure to, if you could just have some sort of a backend channel can't help uh, but wondering like, trusted sources <laughs> yeah, do i really trust this client do i always trust the client um right yeah, yeah. so anywhere where you could provide um, a more secure channel or efficiencies in scaling um and having that just kind of dependable stream of information i mean that just sounds like the better yeah. approach when possible and then doing it through uh, a web standard instead of through uh, one-offs with integrators lets us reuse a lot of work, both on Jamf's end when they want to send signals to others and on Okta's end when we want to receive signals from all kinds of places. Yeah, having uh, some sort of a specification or standard to adhere to definitely makes the discovery work happen a lot more quickly. Mm -hmm. it, it may not necessarily be that you want to implement exactly what the standard has been built to, to state so far, um, but from my perspective, it provides a better opportunity to have that baseline, that starting point um, to then maybe do some innovation on, on top of it, right? And extend it in some way that's going to benefit, you know, the customer or whatever workflow you're trying to support. Yeah, absolutely. So under the hood, there's a couple different kinds of signals that we can send with the shared signals framework. It's, it specifies both CAPE, the Continuous Access Evaluation Protocol, and RISC, the Risk and Incident Sharing and Collaboration Protocol. So how do you see those two protocols differing in their purpose and in their usage? So the way that we've implemented it so far, you know, in this SSF framework, you have uh, both transmitters and receivers. We've set ourselves up to be a transmitter of CAPE-like signals. Uh, we want to be able to provide the context of what we understand about the device and what the, how that state of that device can change over time. In CAPE, we've got event types like session revoked, token claims change, credential change, assurance level change, or device compliance change so far as it stands when we're recording this. Device compliance change is probably most akin to what we're capable of inside of Jamf's stack to provide, but it's not quite what we're doing, you know, we understand device management state. Is it enrolled, unenrolled, managed, unmanaged, and how that kind of changes over time as you think again about the device provisioning lifecycle. Um, and then we also have a device risk calculation. That's part of kind of our ability to detect, you know, different threat events or vulnerabilities on the device. And we take all that information and turn it into a risk level uh, score for the device. Naturally, through the course of a day, you know, that risk level can go up and down based on user behavior. So that's important context that I think a security team is going to want to have to base, you know, um, access policies or authentication policies around. But it's not quite in uh, the specification of CAPE at this point. It conforms to the, the formatting and the standard in so much as it's still like the technically JWT that contains all the mm -hmm. right claims. It's just a slightly different new claim than yeah, than different payload, uh, same delivery vehicle kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a really important part of working with standards that you follow the standard as far as you can, but 
you don't have to stop where the standard stops. You can build on top of it, and then you can reap all of the rewards of the parts that are standardized and limit the uniqueness of what you did that was off the standard to a really small surface area in the scheme of things compared to starting from scratch. It's nice to have that flexibility if it's tolerated. Again, the information that we can provide in our world uh, about the security posture device is important and, and helpful to be able to correlate with other types of security events that you might get from your other vendors. It's to everyone's benefit, I think, to be able to um, enjoy that uh, diversity of types of information and then building policy around um, more than just one single vendor's signal. And you've already had this device information that you're now also sending as shared signals events. Um, what would have happened with that information if a customer is using just um, the full suite of Jamf products, they're using your networking offerings and so forth? Um, I understand that you have zero trust networking that might react to that, uh, those signals or those events in a similar way. Yeah. So like inside of Jamf, we like to talk about this concept of trusted access, mm -hmm. which means authorized users on enrolled devices that are secure and compliant can access sensitive data. And none of that is saying you have to use a particular product to achieve that outcome, but you can see that device provisioning, user provisioning, what that whole enrollment flow looks like. You have to have a device that's managed probably through some sort of MDM. You need to have uh, some sort of endpoint protection software on the device to detect vulnerabilities. You should have some form of protecting network access to sensitive uh, or private applications. We have kind of that full suite for our customers, and we support both Apple and non-Apple platforms in that world. Um, but, you know, as companies scale, as companies are at different um ages of maturity, let's say, they're going to have a whole number of different vendors and services to satisfy all those different requirements. And so yeah, like absolutely. with Jamf, you could adopt the full suite and you would have a managed device that's going to be, you know, secured and protected. And we're going to be able to detect um, whether you're clicking on phishing links or if somebody's installed some sort of malware. And all that information gets, again, digested and turned into like a risk signal or risk score that we can put in front of um, any sort of access policy. So gating access to corporate applications can be dependent on your device meeting some risk level. And again, there's probably oh, yeah. a couple dozen different attributes that are consumed to make up that sort of determination. Um, so you can have your risk engine kind of look at the big picture and say, you're in or you're out. Either you can do your access here under these circumstances, or you just plain cannot access it. Um, am I understanding that sort of gating mechanism correctly there? Yeah, with multitudes of flexibility, right? Yeah. I think in the old world, when we all went into the office and you joined the corporate network, as long as you had the right certificates and joined the company Wi-Fi, you had access to everything. And one level of abstraction from that is you're remote, you have VPN, you've got authenticated your VPN hopefully using your identity provider and single sign-on, but then you still have access to everything that's on the other side of that VPN. Yeah. With ZTNA and, and those types of capabilities, it's about segmenting individual applications and being able to create access policies for particular types of resources so that as a device is, or a user is evaluated for risk, you know, if you're slightly out of data on your operating system, maybe that's okay. And you're going to get access to 95% of your company's applications. But if there's a specific vulnerability that's been detected in a specific operating system and it affects your device in particular, then we can have policies around that that say you're not able to access source code or whatever private application you want to be able to protect. So being able to be far more uh, discreet, yeah. I guess, right. in, in those access mm -hmm. decisions. Like maybe my web browser is out of date, but my Slack client is up to date. And so I can get into Slack just fine, but I shouldn't be accessing resources from the outdated browser until I fix it. Yes. Yes, yeah. that's exactly. So you can do that. You're in or you're out on a much more granular level. But when you start sending these signals to your identity provider, we get another really interesting level of control over security behavior. 
because one of the things we can do with shared signals is we can configure our universal logout product to end all of the active sessions that somebody has at a given point in time. Because initiating a session is a much higher bar of security than continuing an existing session. And we see a lot of attackers leveraging, well, if I can get a session that already exists, I can do stuff with it. But if you can end those sessions um, when a threat event occurs and just force the user to re-authenticate, then if it's the real person, they shouldn't have much trouble because they can do it anytime they want. And if it's not the right person on the right device at the right time, then maybe they can't authenticate at all until they fix whatever's wrong. I personally see this as a really interesting shift from this black and white, like you're in or you're out. First, it's you're in or you're out of the whole network. Then it's you're in or you're out of an app toward you're in now and then out in a moment and then back in again a moment later as you re-authenticate. Having a centralized authority like an IDP in that case allows you to have a much broader set of insights across your environment because it's you're not gaining access based on any particular platform, right? You're just using your centralized identity and authentication to to gain access instead. So if you can incorporate those external, what to me would be like an external risk event uh, to force an authentication on even the platforms that are managed by our platform or devices managed by our platform or else, you end up creating a much more consistent user experience uh, and reducing kind of the burden for what it takes for, an ent for a person to remain secure and remain mm -hmm. productive. That's kind of the primary advantage of relying on an identity provider so much of the time is because of single sign-on, people are comfortable with what it takes to gain access to sensitive things. They are used to whatever their uh, organization's authentication and multi-factor policies are. They understand when they see an Okta login, what that means. Um, being able to tie many of those access decisions back to just that sign-in widget reduces the burden on the end user for, you know, securely gaining access once again. Those, those ergonomics are so huge. So let's think about an example then of using the shared signals framework. Um, if I'm already using Jamf and Okta, what do I need to do to start taking advantage of the shared signals framework integration? Yeah, so depending on how you kind of are introduced to Jamf, what's different about our SSF integration is that this is built out as a part of Jamf Security Cloud. And an administrator or an organization is going to get access to it through our radar product. So that's a, an admin portal on the web that's primarily for our Jamf Protect and Jamf Connect applications. Uh, if you're a you know management customer and you use Jamf Pro, you would still have access to radar for the purposes of this type of an integration, but you may not have delved too much into it unless you were trying to configure one of those other products. Um, and that's the primary difference. When we've kind of built a few of these integrations in the past, they've been inside of Jamf Pro. So if somebody has access to Jamf Security Cloud, they sign into Radar, then there's an access providers integration for configuring your Okta tenant. Uh, so just kind of making that declaration of Okta as your single sign-on provider uh, helps you walk through the rest of the configuration, what you need to do on the Okta side to um, have that relationship of transmitter of Jamf and receiver. Of yeah, there will be a setup doc that I will link in the podcast description, wherever you found the podcast, that will walk you through how to get to the right parts um, of these different apps and what you copy and paste where to get them talking to each other. So once the integration is initiated, once we've got uh, your particular Jamf uh, transmitting and your particular Okta receiving, uh, what kind of events on a user's device might cause one of these signals to be sent? There are a lot of different uh, inputs, and it's going to come down to an individual organization's policy. So uh, again, depending on what you have access to inside of Jamf, what we're primarily doing in Jamf Security Cloud is continuously evaluating state of the device. So that is both state of device based on management. Is the device encrypted? Does it have a local passcode configured? Kind of those state of beings for, yeah. for a Mac. But then also end user behavior. So depending on network traffic, are you attempting to 
access what has been identified as a malicious website? Have you clicked on a phishing link? All these different kind of potential threat vectors. You as an organization can set um, either policy inside of uh, Jamf Security Cloud that automatically tries to prevent, you know, an action based on what the user is doing, uh, try to remediate some of those things, or you can just simply decide to elevate a device's risk level. Again, a lot of it kind of boils down to that device risk level. So if I uh, download and install um, what has been identified as a malicious third-party application, not through an official channel, that can get flagged. And as a result, my device is going to go from risk level, you know, maybe secure or low to risk level medium or risk level high. You kind of can set your yeah. meter <laughs> depending on, on what the event is to your liking. When that happens, we have traditionally just used that device risk level to then dictate uh, access policies within Jamf products. And I think the, the switch here is that as those state changes occur, SSF is the framework that allows for us to actually stream that event change to an external service, specifically Okta, right? Mm -hmm. If I do something that our organization has defined as being risky behavior, then I want to turn that into an event that Okta is aware of and have some sort of policy on that side to remediate you know, user access as a result. So it sounds like for a lot of these events, the administrator on the Jamf side has a choice between sending a signal or auto-remediating. Are there times that you might not be able to auto-remediate when sending a signal might be the only option? In, in some situations, yes, the product can just try to help resolve whatever the issue is. If you're clicking on a phishing link and it's identified as something malicious, then we can just block that. And that's not necessarily going to change the risk signal of the device. Other times it's as simple as Apple published a software update. Um, the device is aware that there's now a software update available. We have policies in place to get that device up to date, but there's a lag time. There's gonna be you know, 14 days before that update's necessarily required and policy you know, pushes it. In the meantime, hey, we've identified there's a Delta here, there's a risk. Um, so let's just at least fire off the signal and say, hey, something to be aware of. Thank you for not forcing the user to do a reboot right the moment the patch comes out. That's um, a great kindness because Bane that would be the existence. other option. <laughs> yes, no, I, yes. Strive for the nice um, blend of security and user experience. That's yeah. every waking you're, moment I think around here. You're allowed to be insecure for a minute, but you can't do as many things until you get back up on that security bandwagon. Right then what might an identity administrator configure a policy to do as a result of getting a signal? Let's say, oh, an update's available and um, Mike's device is not up to date yet. Yeah, this is going to sound a little heavy handed, but I think the main trigger or the main event that you'd want to kick off as a result right now is just revoking user mm -hmm. sessions. We, you want to get them back into that state where the user is going to have to re-authenticate, re-attest their identity, mm -hmm. put them through that verification process again. And maybe that's not the right answer in all of these situations, but that's where it's nice to have that flexibility where you can set your risk level based on particular inputs. And, and again, maybe only when the status changes to high, are you going to really want to have to pull that emergency break and, and, and do something maybe a little brash, but yeah, but then if it's a moment where we're no longer certain that this really is the person who authenticated and it could be an attacker, better safe than sorry. You have that path now. You didn't really mm -hmm. have it before. You're limited or you're constrained at least to the capabilities of one particular platform, and it's nice to be able to have that more option. Yeah, and as more and more integrators start developing SSF transmitters, SSF receivers, we're going to see, I think, a lot of creative things being done with this because it's ultimately a protocol that allows us to see the big picture of what's going on with the user and really accurately describe what sets of behaviors are okay, what sets of signals mean that something is wrong. So if you're an integrator who wants to send or receive signals, 
contact Dev Advocacy at Okta to get into a pilot program and to find out more as we put out the call for integrators to work directly with us in developing this. I would finish with reminding you that this is all really early days for the Shared Signals framework, and integrators will have ideas that may not be in the specs yet or may not have been explored yet for what it's helpful to send and receive. So if you've ever had an idea for a security action to take based on that big picture of everything that's happening for a user gone, oh, I wish my app could just automatically do this thing when that other thing over there happens, SSF is absolutely worth looking into. So thank you so much for joining me, Mike, and sharing about um, SSF with us. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time and, and giving us kind of a opportunity to talk about what we've been up to and appreciate the partnership. Yeah, and thank you everybody for listening.